My name is Zora Zambezi Williams, and I'm a mobile apps account manager at Google. And we're at my grandmother's house in Southeast DC. We're definitely very connected to our ancestors and like their energies and things like that. That's something that I think is really precious to my family, why it's important for us to honor our history, honor our roots, honor our blackness. I consider my grandmother to be a matriarch of the family. I think she's the most consistent figure that we've all had. My mom had seven children, uh -huh. six girls and one, one boy. boy and one boy. Mm. And she taught everybody to, to say, my brother can do anything we could do. We're just very close and I just felt very safe and everything was consistent here. My parents named me Zora after Zona Hurston and I feel very connected to her mostly because of her personality. I think she definitely had a very can-do personality and I think she didn't feel prison to the systems that be. And it also helps me move through the world in the US. Yes, I'm black. Yes, I see these things. Yes, I'm victim of these things in some way, but I don't know, it doesn't guide me. My dad's a historian and he would teach us history in a lot of non-traditional ways, I'd say. For example, he would show us different current events that would happen in the news, like a picture or an article, and connect that to something that's happened in the past and explain like why that thing wasn't accidental or really new, but maybe a reproduction of something that has happened and why that's important to take note of and how we can move forward with that information. I bring my culture experience to work in a variety of ways. I think that Google, they give you a lot of opportunity to express yourself and to teach people. I also brought my dad to speak. We talked about who counts as black. That was the name of the talk. And we talked about how in the United States, it's confusing. You know, I'll say I'm black. Maybe someone who's the child of a Senegalese immigrant may say they're black too, but we're very different. So we kind of gave a little explanation to my organization about why that happens, how they can interact with it, why you may not know that, why people try to make blackness a monolith, things like that. Juneteenth was a part of my upbringing. My parents really wanted us to have a strong connection to our black identity. It's something that I feel like my family had always talked about. Well, why should we celebrate it? Because you're free. It's important that we as Black Americans celebrate Juneteenth because it's a way for us to mark the beginning of our freedom here in the United States and a way for us to actually carve out our own happiness in the United States. My cousins decided to have a Juneteenth celebration this year. This is the first time that we're all gonna be able to really fellowship together at my grandmother's house since the pandemic. Yeah, it's gonna be a potluck, potluck barbecue. So that's what's happening this year. If you identify as American, you should recognize Juneteenth as part of America. And if you identify as American citizens specifically, it's, we are American citizens. That was the beginning of our path to citizenship. That was the beginning of our path to becoming just like you, to becoming true compatriots. We are all one, we are all different. The, you, those people's stories are my story. I, you can't ignore it and also be a part of the American fabric. It just won't work. My name is Samantha Harris, and I am a Program Strategy and Operations Manager at Google. My grandparents moved to Inkster originally from Milledgeville, Georgia. At the time, a lot of Black families were moving up north via the Great Migration. All of the homes in, on my street, it was a circle, like a cul-de-sac. So all the homes faced each other. So it did feel really like a community. It was like a tight-knit community for sure. So I was raised in Inkster, but went to school in a neighboring city, Taylor, which is it's a little south from Inkster. My parents made the decision very early on to send us to Taylor schools as opposed to Inkster or Detroit schools. Both communities in both cities are very poor, but Taylor was white and poor and Inkster was black and poor. I was in Taylor schools from preschool all the way through graduation. Going to school and being educated in Taylor definitely had an effect on how I saw my own blackness at the time. You know, no one explicitly came and sat me down and said, black is bad and white is good, but we grow up in a white supremacist society that tells us that anyway, via our media channels, via via the education that we're receiving. Having my own differences consistently pointed out, they're telling me that my characteristics, my features, my speech, um, you know, even my home, they don't fit. And so I internalize that, basically do whatever I can to not bring attention to my blackness. 
So I was accepted into the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. It was big because it was college, but it was also the only black people that I knew were either my family or you know, my community in Inkster. And so it was overwhelming for me to be around all of this blackness demonstrated and like role modeled for me essentially. I, I carried all of the learning, I carried all of like the animosity and the resentment and like the, the shame that I felt about demonstrations of blackness. I carried that with me and it was corrected right away. There were so many things that I didn't realize I didn't know until I started making these relationships and having these really beautiful friendships with especially black women um, at Michigan. If it wasn't for black women at Michigan, I question how long it might've taken me um, to, to unlearn some of those things. It's, it just really made me start to question the, my understanding of, of how I thought of blackness. And it, it kind of sparked my interest in figuring out what else do I not know? Or what else do I, have I, have I learned in kind of a very biased way that maybe I should challenge some of these concepts? I was most compelled to like radical black text. I was really on a mission to figure out who I am. I definitely feel compelled to teach others about blackness. I know how that feels, internalizing anti-blackness, but not having the vocabulary to explain that. I know how it feels on the other side, I guess. That is a feeling that all Black people deserve. You deserve to feel how it feels to truly honor your Blackness because you understand how triumphant and resilient and strong we are. I didn't learn about Juneteenth until I got to college. It didn't really click to me, you know, like all of the other contexts around it until after I graduated and was having continuous conversations with my friends here in Detroit. I think like the beauty in us reclaiming Juneteenth is that we can define and decide how we want to celebrate it. I'm excited to see how Black people in New Orleans are gonna are gonna do Juneteenth versus how Black people in Baltimore are gonna do Juneteenth. I'm excited to see how, like, what happens when Black people learn to really understand how lovely we are and how how like wonderful we are and have the opportunity to really get to celebrate that in whatever way we see fit. I get really energized by Black creation, and this is another Black creation that I will be front row and center for. My name is Kwame Webster, and I'm a program manager for the Research DEI team at Google. My parents named me Kwame because of several reasons. One is they had a very Pan-African sort of mindset, and they wanted to ensure that their children also shared that mindset. As a, a PK or pastor's kid, my dad really didn't really push us to necessarily project some sort of image. We pretty much kind of like melted into most of the kids in the church, and a lot of us are still good friends. So it's a, a pretty cool like childhood. Um, but I think that also was because we were in New Orleans and because of not just who my dad was, but who my mom was and sort of like who was attracted to the church. My mom, she had dreadlocks in the early 90s, had a nose ring, I think a couple of nose rings. I think she had her uh, upper ear pierced at one point. And so I think that brought people who again, weren't necessarily excited about church initially or had some bad experiences. I think that brought them into the fold. And then the fact that my dad was very much like pro-Black and again, Pan-African, um, along with my mom, meant that people did not have to make a sort of distinction between um, you know, worshiping as Christians and then being African-Americans. They really could bring both of those sides together. The church actually functioned like an, uh, an, an African family. With that, it became the center of, of a group of people who found interior resources 
um, that were not only buffers, but correctives against um, America's original sin of racism. So I think that one of the first times I just remember Juneteenth as like a thing was my mom was just wearing like a Juneteenth shirt. And I just remember looking at it and I remember it was, you know, one of the prominent features were hands that were breaking and, um, you know, black people basically celebrating. There was one church member who really wanted to ensure that the church celebrated Juneteenth. And so I think one of the initial celebrations that we were part of was at the church. And then as time kind of went on and, and more people understood and, and other people could share their experiences, a lot more of the celebration shifted to, um, I think, Armstrong Park and Congo Square, which has a pretty deep significance to Black folks um, because it was a place where during enslavement, Black people could at least one day a week dance, uh, exchange, you know, commerce, um, and really kind of at least have more of a connection to the cultures that they were coming from. Um, and it was something that also was very much like cross uh, racial, cross religious. Um, many of the black Muslims would be involved. There would also be white people who would attend. And now that we, you know, we now live abroad technically um, in, in Canada, I'm still very interested in seeing how you know, black people here, if there is somewhat of a celebration or acknowledgement, and then what sort of is my role and maybe helping bring that along the same way that my parents did in New Orleans 30 years ago. At, at its core, Juneteenth is about celebration. It is about moving from one category of bondage to a category of freedom and possibility. When we sort of move too far away from the, the positivity and the joy of the celebration, then I think we actually lose some of the, the point. I think joy is an integral part of the Juneteenth experience. And I would want my children to know that this is a, a happy, holiday that I want them to celebrate. Though it started from a dark time and a, and a hard time that we're continuing to move hopefully in a direction that will lead to a greater sense of freedom for everyone. It's just critically important for us to reflect on the past, but again, look forward to the future and the celebrations that we know are waiting for us.